What about my sweat equity? Sweat equity. Howdy, Johnny. I wasn't ready for it. You weren't ready for that? I still hate it. We'll let the intro play out. We're going to bring in our guest via Zoom, uh, Greg Bay of Core Shorts. Um, let him hear you from Vancouver. Yes, that's great to see you guys. Good to see you too, sir. I guess the company would actually be Cortection, correct? Yeah, that's the name of the con- the company, yes. Okay. Oh, I'm fired. All right, I'll leave. Sorry, uh, I'll see yeah. myself out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I just want to get it straight. Core shorts is what they make. Okay. And we'll get into that, and we'll let Greg tell us about it so I don't screw it up. Um, but, uh, yeah, Greg and I have been working together a little bit. Uh, he's work- looking to get his podcast started. Um, and, again, he can tell you a little bit more about it, but... Um, yeah, I'm excited. He's got a lot of good, uh, a lot of good connections. Yeah, he's name dropped Gretzky a couple times now, so we're gonna have to talk about that. The great one. Yeah. Really. Yeah. No, I, I'm lucky to surround myself with people that uh, that that know more than me. That's part of my strategy over time. So, you know, the uh, sports world is a is a pretty tight world once you start taking a look at uh, how many trainers and athletic therapists and equipment guys are out there so there's a lot of interconnection certainly between the leagues and the uh, and the clubs even within the same uh the same profession so uh yeah th- th- it's it's a lot of crossover for sure well so part of this podcast is to kind of glean off of uh try to absorb any anything you've learned in your experiences and one thing you just reminded me of that we used to say we used to remind people a lot is you never want to be the smartest person in the room, you know? Uh, so if, you're, if you find yourself in a room that you're the smartest person where you're trying to do some business, you know, or networking or something, might be time to find the other one, you know, find a, a new space to get in. I don't know if I agree. Well, why not? Why don't you want to be the smartest person in the room? Because I don't know. Because Is that you're just insecurity coming to the No, service? you're not seeking. You're, you're seeking ego you're seeking like uh, approval that you're smart over seeking out more knowledge. What if you just know you're smarter? <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's wisdom, but I think part of it, part of it is being like, I don't know everything in a room full of people too. Right. Yes. So everybody's got I'm, their own specialties. Yeah. At the same right. time. I'm not going to talk about hamstrings and how to flex <laughs> them. <laughs> Both of you guys would know way more than I do. And Greg would know way more than I did. Trust me. Right. Yeah. He's actually got the degrees to show it. Greg, do you want to tell us about Core Shorts and the idea behind them and what makes them so awesome? Sure. Sure, thanks. Uh, well, basically, as a, as a therapist, we're always trying to invent or create strategies to help our athletes or our clients to go from injury to functional recovery. So many years ago... Um, well, first of all, we'll even back it up further to the idea. You know, you, you become a student of what you do, and that's uh, reviewing literature, having a certain group of people, people that you uh, banter with, and, and then also uh, a group of mentors that you rely on for guidance and education. And so when you're always asking yourself questions and then seek to find answers, it allows you to stay current with the literature and the research and then when you're on the front lines of doing the work then it's a great blend of being able to be practical as well as uh, academic about an approach so the bottom line was uh, on our Friday evening get-togethers you know over a beverage we would pick different topics of discussion and and oftentimes just go over some case studies uh, throughout the week that we found very interesting. No names, of course. Uh, so this one, one Friday evening, uh, I was sitting with uh, my mentor, Cliff Fowler, and uh, three other physios and an exercise scientist. Sounds like a, a joke coming up, like we were sitting in a boat and something happened. There. <laughs> but it really was me complaining about the fact that 
doing hip spikas, which was with a long tensor wrap over a groin around a hip and down to a thigh, they didn't work. At that time, I was even teaching athletic injuries and you teach it, but you go, this is rubbish. Um, so with soccer and being the soccer therapist for a number of years, you know, we've had a lot of groin injuries. I, I, I say I was an ex hockey player. I think that would be a matter of opinion. Uh, my, my teammates would probably call it something different. Uh, but there was a lot of groin injuries in, in hockey as well. And if the hip spike is didn't work, we would just put on a pair of really tight bike type of compression shorts. And those didn't work very well either. So uh, over a few beer, it was about discussing the, the literature, discussing the science and the anatomy of how it works. And, uh, you know, it, it came down to us, you know, flipping a beer coaster over and drawing an X. And that X represented the foundation of core shorts, which is that you need to tie in a moving leg with a stable opposite hip and you need to do it both front and back. So you end up with uh, an X at the front from one leg, uh, one hip down to the opposite leg, right and left. And then you do the same at the back and that gets superimposed onto a compression short. So now you've got compression, but when you go to move a leg, one of those bands tightens up as you move. And then as you move your other leg, the other band tightens up. So you've always got a dynamic stabilizer as you go to move. And that's exactly what the anatomy does. The lower abdominal muscles on one side actually connect across to the groin muscles on the other side of the hip. And then at the back, the big latissimus dorsi that comes down, it connects across the low back to the opposite gluteus maximus. And those are collectively called the anterior and posterior diagonal sling systems. And the truth is, is that's been human anatomy for thousands of years. So really, I don't have anything new other than copying uh, the, hand of, uh, the hand of God and saying, how do we reproduce this support system in a garment? And uh, that was the start of it in 1999 over a beer. Yeah, I tried them on, and it made me feel like I've been walking wrong or moving wrong my whole life. I was like, oh, this this is interesting. Was what does like, it feel like? A corset I don't know. Bottom? It feels like a, a nun telling you to sit up straight or something. It's weird. It's like... Uh, oh, it helps your know. posture when you're sitting down? I mean, for me, it made me, you know, want to stand, like, walk taller, you know? Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, I can see why Buford T. Pusser County here. It's a walking tall reference. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> I didn't get it. Yeah, you got to see the walking tall the movie, and you get all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. get with the two by four. Remember that? Yeah, the, uh, it was remade with the rock. Yeah, right. I knew that right. one. Right. Buford. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, but go. if if they feel it's that's the big difference. I've never heard. I have compression shorts like the Nike Pro. Uh, combat, whatever they yeah. came out with about five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And, you know, the, I feel those, but they just feel tight. That, that's all they feel. You're telling me they feel different. And I, I don't want to sound like an infomercially. This, I want this to be an authentic conversation, but I'm asking Eric, like, I didn't want to be like, you're telling me well, that I, these, you know, I didn't yeah. want to no, say I know. it like that. Well, it's just, it makes it, you can kind of feel the, the pushing and the pulling going on. It kind of keeps you in the right, uh, I don't know, it doesn't let you overextend, I guess, and I'm speaking here just out from my experience, but Greg would know better. Um, but yeah, it's uh, very interesting, because I mean, you guys got a patent on it, and you know, that's not easy to get. How, how long did that take to get? Oh, I'll tell you what, we were lucky when, when I first took the uh, samples into the patent lawyer, and we had a look at it, I'd already did some homework on it based on my patent searches, but that's just from a lay person. So I was expecting a, a three to five year potential patent um, uh, time frame because of the fact that you've got to get it all done, then you've got to submit it, and then it goes to a committee. The committee has to do all their research. They have to bump up against the literature of potential infringements. and. We, uh, we applied for a patent in 
2000, and uh, we were granted our patent, our U.S. patent in 2001. So wow. we were just over a year. So my patent lawyer went, wow, wow, that's, uh, I wasn't expecting that quick. Yeah, yeah, that that's um, really quick. I, I would I thought you were going to say something like ten years or something <laughs> because that's the horror story I always hear. It took me longer than that to trademark the name of our show <laughs> through legal zoom. Yeah. I almost gave up with that. Yeah, <laughs> so much paperwork and whatnot. But yeah, I mean that that yeah the IP lawyer game is 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 uh, going to be very lucrative in the future. But um, so. What? How many iterations have have these shorts had? Because it's been, if it's been about twenty years, yeah. you got to tinker with it. If you're a guy who made a product, you're probably a tinker kind of person, engineering kind of minded, um, and you're you're never going to be satisfied as the you know inventor owner operator. It's you can always improve it, right? So where what can you tell us a timeline of what you've learned? throughout that product, you know, process. Well, I can, and I can also tell you that I'm waiting on samples next week for tinkering that we just did again. Yeah. Oh, nice. And uh, so part of it was, oh, my gosh, if you should see the first pair we did, <laughs> it was like, what is that? You know? What did it look but like? I, I, that's how it started. It started uh, with a concept. And so our very first pair... Took, it took me about a year working with a, a, a sewer. And then that pair had to be modified to 2002, 2003. We went through every year for five years modifications. And then, bang, we had something that we could get uh, tested with uh, in the journals. So we get a research paper on it. And our first question was, not did it help you, but did it hinder you? So if we were going to put this product on a hockey player or a professional athlete in particular, we wanted to be able to assure them that it wasn't going to slow them down. It wasn't going to restrict movement. It wasn't going to um, uh, challenge performance and it wasn't going to injure them. So because uh, the first question isn't how does it make me better? The first question is, does this thing actually inhibit me from doing what I need to do? So I have approximately 30 versions of the shorts and that 30 versions of the shorts is tinkering on the design and the fit. It's tinkering on the material to give us exactly the right amount of tension so that we had to engineer our material to get it right. And then it's really based on the fact that we tried now to have three versions because we needed three different levels of stability support because not everybody needs uh the same type of stability so yeah I, I i just was looking in my i'll tell you what as an innovator you drive your family crazy mm -hmm. because i've got shorts in the bedroom they're up in the den they're all over the dining room and this has been going on over 20 years my wife starts saying do you need your own house for this <laughs> Well, you know? I, I love the entrepreneurial process because I'm going to guess before you got into this idea, you weren't a tailor or anything or in, the, in the fashion area, right? No, I, I, could, I could staple the hem on my pants. That's mm -hmm. about as good as what I could do, yeah. So you're learning all, this, all the, that side of the production on the fly, it sounds like. We, I'm, we're talking 20 years ago plus, oh, right? Oh, Yeah. Oh, complete. Uh, I'll tell you what, the lady that helped us was recommended to me, and she's actually a designer in the movie industry. So what's really cool is, is that she's used to building stuff from scratch. And, uh, Smart. you know, our shorts really modeled more of a girdle than it did a compression short because <laughs> because of the fabrics. Yeah. yeah. Girdle's not a very sexy word, so I'm glad you didn't <laughs> stick with core girdle. No. <laughs> core. <laughs> we're bringing girdles core back. Core girdle 2.0. <laughs> yeah, we're into shapewear now. Yeah, girdle is one of those words that I remember playing football. They're like, all right, here, go make sure you have your girdle and all that. I'm like, oh, can't we rename this, it's guys? It's close to moist in, in yeah. the words that kind of... Mm -mm. I don't know if it's on that level, but... I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, can I get those... Mo we have models here that are, are off camera. Can I go get those and put them on camera? Yeah, if you want. I'll, you ask... All right. 
Oh, yeah, you got to put it on. Uh, I was on a show in Canada called The Dragon's Den, and that actually was a precursor to the Shark Tank in the U.S. And it's sort of cool because two of the guys that were on my show, my show, the show, are two, uh, two of the sharks, right? Kevin O'Leary and... Uh, we got them, oh, right, right up in our faces. Yeah. There we go. Mental blank. So, uh, you know, and, and O'Leary looked at it and said, oh, I can't imagine squeezing my package that way. You know? <laughs> yeah, it well, does. It puts what, a nice squeeze on it. I'll give it that. If you're injured, you'll, you'll put, the, put the tight package on. I'll have plenty of room to Airbnb that out. So <laughs> no problem with my, my junk. Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a grower, not a shower. So, uh, you know, mine looks like uh, three... <laughs> Three bums kind of huddled up around a campfire, <laughs> normally. So uh, I, I have no problem. I was looking at these. I was True. like, these models, um, you know, they're looking pretty girthy. Uh, yeah, you don't want a small thing. Right? right? No, you don't want to bum everybody out like I do. If, if a girl sees me, yeah, uh, that I'm dating, you don't let her see you naked in normal normal position. Right. Yes. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> I Thanks found it interesting, I Greg. Don't, well, I don't know, uh, Greg, if you have listened to this show, but we, uh, we pride ourselves in being pragmatic, entrepreneurial advice, learning through others, plus dick jokes. So that's kind of our lane. <laughs> Surprise, I didn't tell him that. Oh, okay. Well, we, we try to... Too late now, Greg. You're in it, <laughs> We lure you in. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but and we, we have a theory that uh, you know everybody likes dick jokes, and if you don't, you're a liar. So Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, now I got up to go get this. What, what were y'all talking about? Um, well, we were talking about, uh, the dragon's den and all, and he was just, he wrapped it up right when you, uh, sat down. Oh. But, um, I found it interesting, Greg, that, uh, the first thing you had to do was consider whether or not it hindered performance and not just did what you wanted it to do. Cause I mean, really it's like, sure, we can make shorts that look like a diaper underneath that you, that you won't get hurt in those shorts, but you won't be able to run either. Yeah. They look like, uh, they definitely look like, um, cool, like the cool, uh, I'd be jealous if I played hockey and I saw a guy wearing these before he put on all his gear kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when under armor came out for football, that's all the, all the, <laughs> I like, I always had soccer cleats and nothing else. The girl they gave you. But when those were starting to come out for high school kids to wear, I was like, Oh, that looks so comfortable instead of having a shirt underneath your pads. And I bet hockey players dig these more than anybody, if I had to guess. Because that's all lower body strength, you know? Yeah, it's been a real viral thing in the sense that one guy finds them and then next thing you know, the whole dressing room's in them because that's why over 300 NHLers are in them is because there is both a real and a perceived benefit, you know, and for a lot of athletes, the the feel of something is just as important as the action behind it. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's what you said, Eric, is the experience of putting them on gives you a feeling. Yeah. You know? And uh, that feeling is anatomically putting you into a better neutral position for, for anything that you want to do. Yeah. It's like uh, if I go to – if I somebody gives me a golf club that's not mine – and I don't like the way it looks when I'm looking down. I'm like, I'm not going to hit a good shot. I, I, this is not, I don't like this. It looks too fat on the end or something. It's all, you know, athletes, you know, they're, they have brains too. They're going to be mentally influenced by stuff like this. And, you know. Well, that's validating, right? 300 NHL players, that, that, that has to be the best form of a five-star review in a way, right? Because athletes at that level, you know, Eric and I, if you get us drunk enough, we'll still think we're athletes. But uh, but yeah. we didn't – we were laughing about this last night is uh, his dad got offers to play pro baseball. Mine played pro football, and we got our mom's genetics. But we still think – we right. still think we got some game Yeah, <laughs> uh, in, in the respective sports. But it, it's one of those things where at that highest level in the NHL, you know, they'll do whatever gives them an advantage without – you know, if it's not like roids or something, but th that has to be the best form of validation uh, available by an athlete, right? It really is. And part of the strategy when we started, uh, when I looked at 
sort of my business partners as I went from being a sole guy creating something as an innovator was then how do we put a business around it was the fact that um, I met uh, one of my partners at Georgica on the set of Miracle, which was the movie about the 1980 uh, gold medal team. Uh, Kurt Russell was the star. Of oh, yeah, show. yeah. And, and we're sitting on the um, up in the stands because, you know, when they say action in a movie, it doesn't last very long. Uh, so you've got a lot of downtime. And we were t talking and we came full circle with the fact that he remembered the shorts as a beta test I sent to Ottawa because I knew somebody. And and we basically decided that, that we should get into this gig together because if it didn't pass the sniff test of the professional athlete, then it wouldn't get by the sniff test uh, uh, from the, um, the weekend warrior. And that's, uh, you know, validating from the top down because of the fact that I'm not going to, first of all, I'm not going to produce something that isn't going to do what it's proposed to do. This isn't a pet rock. This was really designed because I had nothing to give my clients or athletes to go from injury to functional recovery. And it needed to be a single garment. It had to be a little bit dummy proof, put it on and go. Um, so with that intent in mind, it still had to, it still had to get top down marketing. Yeah. We needed that approval. You wanted the, um, you know, that first mover kind of thing. It had, it had to work or else, it wouldn't work in the future, right? Is that, I, I kind of, I'm the same way. Uh, any company I've worked for and they want me to do any business development or marketing for them, and when I had my own agency running, I couldn't sell it unless I really believed in what the product or service was. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's kind of a, a similar kind of vibe. Uh, you wouldn't be able, you could, you could go, uh, well, we could get this manufactured and, get it in high volume and then get it, just get it out there and who cares? We'll just put in the, the department stores, the lower department stores that need a, a sports, you know, kind of compression thing in there quickly, but you want quality over, you know, doing that. And that's probably, that's definitely why it's as successful as it is right now, where you have these premier athletes using it. It is. And, and, you know, when we are talking and educating people as opposed to selling, it comes down to here's what here's what you can take away for your athlete. But to the therapist or the team physician, here's what you need to take away and experience as well. Because we don't expect I don't expect somebody to endorse it without actually having a valid endorsement of them, not of them having the experience. So we often will make sure that the team trainers and medical staff have some product because if it doesn't get by their sniff test, they're not going to stick it on one of their players just because some guy's trying to sell it. So they get the concept. I don't, I try not to sell by hype. I try and sell through need and education as a sports therapist. And I got to tell you that we've had the product, licensed to Under Armour for nine years. Mm -hmm. The first three years was awesome. Then it started to, to fade away. And part of that fading away was, as a group, we didn't figure out how to educate the end consumer in the big box stores. So even though there was an Under Armour waistband, which was pretty cool, it still was a technical product for a purpose. And so part of us taking the product back from Under Armour was A, to modify it back to its original function and, and uh, goals. Second was to upgrade it and update it. And then third was, was to make sure the messaging is well aligned with what the product purpose is. And, uh, and that, that, you know what, that was a lesson for both sides. And I appreciate the fact that through Kevin Plank that we got the product back because um, it is my baby and entrepreneur to entrepreneur, he did recognize the fact that this product probably needs to be in your hands better than it does ours. 
Yeah, I'm on Cortection uh, dot com. Uh, C O R E T E C T I O N dot com, and uh, I'm looking. I was looking at an affiliate program, and it looks like you're going that uh, a, a little bit of a different kind of route in terms of making sure it is that higher level academically. Where like this is the this is the premier kind of fitness wear and there's an affiliate program. If there's any, um, you know, physical therapists listening, massage therapists, chiropractors, all that kind of stuff. They have it on their site. If you want to go over there, check it out or email at affiliate at cortection.com. Uh, that's an interesting route. That reminds me when I worked at an air purifier company, they wanted us to be in, every, <laughs> so in all the, around uh, the package here. <laughs> they wanted us to be, uh, in a similar way, get in every uh, as many uh, allergist office as possible. And it's funny, ten, ten, that was 10 years ago, I went in to take my kids to the allergist, and there's rabbit air sitting in there. I'm like, uh-huh. I don't know, that's weird. Yeah. That's part you of it. You did it. I, I, I was part of it. One that. for one. Yeah, yeah. But mm-hmm. um, I, I, th- I find that a good route to go because that is, um, that is a manageable growth, right? If if Under Armour came to you again or someone high like big like that and they wanted to license uh, the patent out, I don't know how that works. License the product. Uh, I don't know how y'all had that set up, but if right. Nike came to you or one of the big dogs came to you and they go, "We need X amount and <laughs> you know under ninety days," you'd be like, uh, "No thanks," because it it it's that's a lose lose kind of proposition kind of thing. And I think this has a different. You're putting it, part of the branding is putting it in there with the professionals. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, we take a look at, we get excited about the sexiness of athletes. Um, But, you know, we got a lot of postpartum moms with loose pelvises that need a functional control system to manage their activities of daily living once baby arrives. We've got so many people with total hip replacements that aren't, uh, what, what's the latest stat? The latest stat is uh, 10 years ago, 80% of total hips were over the age of 70. Now, 80% of total hips are under the age of 70. Really? Yeah, because we're all the baby boomers now, right? So 55 to 65 is a huge number of hip replacements being done. And from that point, these these hip replacement people are wanting to go back and throw a ball, hit a golf club, you know, smack a tennis ball, go for a hike, go for a bike ride. They're not saying, oh, now I need to baby this hip until I die. What they're saying is I get a second hip and I'm going to get in good shape and I'm going to smartly but return to max function for whatever it is. And that's such a huge uh, market for the short based on, stabilization of the low back pelvis and hip so the short isn't designed really for an athlete the short is really designed for people who need a low back pelvic hip support system in order for them to have a better quality of life yeah i mean look i i look i'm looking at the home page with the model and the muscles and all that stuff kind of showing the contortion I don't know if that's the right word. Like sure. twist, twist. Sure. Uh, well, I, I'm, I, I am that kind of candidate in the 35 year old range because I'll call it the dad bod market, uh, where I've got really bad hips, lower back. Uh, I'm working slowly on it with uh, like stretching and yoga, but something like this seems very. I'm, I'm what you call bottom heavy. I've got an ass that don't quit. Um, <laughs> It's it's a good ass. It's such a good ass that Brazilian women stop me. Yeah, they ask how I get it. It's a good one. I go, hey, look, part of it's a gift, part of it's squats. You know, you just gotta. It's 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 nature nurture sometimes, but um, (laughs) you're gonna lose track of what you wanted to say talking about your own ass. I know it's so great. It's when I it's like the Michael Jordan documentary. I start thinking about Michael Jordan, how great he is. I think about my own ass. Yeah, I know. Uh, No, um, or Wayne Gretzky. And Gr- Wayne Gretzky's ass. No, okay. okay. But I'm like, I, before I was coming over here, I was like, do I have enough time to even stretch? Because I can feel everything tighten up. Uh, and this seems like, this product seems good for, 
I think most Americans, I think a 50%, 40 to 50% are obese. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of that has to do when you get, you start getting, try to get back in shape, that real core area really kind of prevents you the third day. You know, everybody has that, like whatever that stopping point people laugh about, like they get back and working out. It's like the three day they're so sore. They can't do anything or a week. Right. And you know, and I think that's just a lot of core stuff. So I feel like this would help. Well, that's why they call it the core. It's the, it's the, you know, it's the epicenter. You know, most people are doing the stuff where they're sitting down all day. And if you're overweight and you want to start this new exercise program, that's not going to be strong enough to do what you used to do or what you think you can do most of the time, you know, like, and most people are super tight in through their pelvis area and, you know, all that. And it's just waiting to be injured. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you found a lot of like, what, what's the best stories you've heard from the non-athletes from the weekend warrior people or from people that just found the product and any, any good testimonials that way? Well, we got a great picture once from uh, a lady that had to have the heavy pair because she had these pelvic problems. And the picture came, and it was um, a beautiful wedding picture. And then she pulled up her wedding dress, and boom, there's the shorts uh, underneath it. And uh, Y'all are the new Spanx. She had the best night of dancing at her wedding and it was because she had the stability from the shorts. So I'm hoping that the shorts weren't on all night, of course, because of the <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, it's certainly for the dancing, uh, played a big role in making her evening better. That's interesting. Like, Hey, by the way, Spanx came out of Florida. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tampa. Yeah. The owners from uh, Clearwater, but, um, I'm going to start wearing them to weddings. I, I got me a pair. Yeah. I mean, like, look, traveling, my butt on... hurts after dancing all night, man. I'm not used to that. Like I, like, you know, I, I'm very expressive when I dance. But what about I'm, like the yeah. leg kicks and stuff? So. A little bit of Elaine in you. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. when, but when you go to like, when you travel, right, you have all these weird, or, or how about this? I got a good one. Moving. Moving your, sure, yeah. moving, uh, your apartment or house or whatever. You have all these weird uh, soreness areas. Mm-hmm. I mean, both of us work out every day, and I'll still, like, if you're moving, you're just like, yeah. why do I feel so terrible? Oh, because I'm moving weird stuff, you know, with yeah. fingertips and yeah. like hunched over instead of doing it properly and packing. Like, I bet these would be awesome. I'm going to move in a month, so I'm going to put some of these on. Good. Uh, yeah. We can get you a pair. We got a couple here. Yeah, we'll get you a pair. Um, we should touch on uh, Greg's upcoming podcast, uh, Injuries, Innovations, and Insights, that's coming soon. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. Teleproducing, sort of. I've never done it. You know, over the border, but um, we've been kind of just uh, working back and forth, trying to get them set up, ready to go. Well, you not only get the technical part with Eric, you get creative uh, part also to wrangle you in or help you out. So if you ever need that part, that's well, we just had a meet. We just that's what we did a couple of days ago. We were well, talking that, about all that stuff. So. I'll promote Eric because he won't promote himself because that's a rare dual threat that a lot of <laughs> producers don't have. You're usually a technical guy or you're a creative guy. You don't have both. So, um, well, hey, man, you got to get – if you can get work out of our podcast too, that's good too. Uh-huh. Well, exactly. You know, it's uh, – I'm, I'm over the moon because, you know, the connections I've been able to make over the last – really 35 40 years is about the fact that people don't need to have the same experience i had which was feeling like i was just on my own island at times like i don't know where to go i don't know who to turn to i go get business help from a multi-billionaire but that doesn't help me necessarily at the grassroots level and there's so many people in the sports medicine or the activity world that have great ideas And, you know, we all have ideas, but how do you get them from an idea to a commitment to put it down, to get the research done, to get prototypes done, and and not uh, go broke doing it, and not lose your family because your your brain gets so sidetracked or single-tracked. And so injuries, innovations, and insights is all about the ability to bring on some guests who have been successful and some who haven't in sort of the product world in, in 
in making people have allowing people to have better lives. So from the the uh, head sports med of professional teams to the researchers that are that are in the trenches asking the questions, giving us the results to some of the you know top clinicians in in the, in the field talking about different innovations that are that are there now um, so that that the listeners can have a, a look and a feel about the fact that maybe they can move something from a thought to an action and then from an action to to an actual product so um, you know the, the, it really is born out of the fact that um, I've got a lot of connections now where people don't have to do what I did. They can probably fast track significantly better by having some of the education and mentorship by some of the guests we can uh, have on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like part of this podcast, it's therapeutic is going, hey, uh, to anybody younger than us, here's where we fucked up. And, you know, please don't do it. <laughs> like yeah. we just had a, a guy on last episode I go, look, man, you're where I was six years ago. Here's all the things I messed up in. And uh, here's I'm the ghost of Christmas future. Don't do it that way. The product timeline, the product creation, and uh, from concept, ideation, to, to getting it out to market is a, a journey that is really hard to empathize with unless you're around it in that supply chain. You've done it yourself. Uh, I think it's, but it's always an interesting story for anybody to listen to. So I think, uh, yeah. And note that it was 2001. He got that patent. It's 2020 now. So it's like, you know, things are still moving. He's still working all, you know, it's like, doesn't ever get easier. It's going to, you know, it's going to be something all the time. And it never happens fast enough. Right. Um, and we always talk about entrepreneurship is it, it's an isolating journey. Even it, if your spouse is there with you the whole time, they still will never really get it because the pressure's on you. You're spending all this time away, and maybe most people are working two jobs. You know, that's a second job that doesn't make money yet until it makes money. And sometimes if they don't get it 100%, it could be a riff. You know, yeah. like it can cause strife big time. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for Greg and his podcast. I mean, just knowing what he knows and then his enthusiasm and the fact that it's a specific thing that I haven't heard too much about this, you know, the injury idea, you know, like with podcasting, it's, if you can have a niche, it's better. It's not, you don't have to have this mass appeal to really become successful in what you're wanting to do. So I'm excited for him. Man. Yeah. If you had a hundred business professionals listening to this, right, that, Think of that in a room. That's amazing. We always talk about that. We'll we'll do this if ten people listen because it's like, think of ten people in a room listening to us just talk for an hour, you mm -hmm. know, or thirty four minutes or whatever we do. Um, but yeah, and and you've got a good disposition. We've never had a guest that smiled as much <laughs> as as you have, <laughs> uh, uh, as you know. And that screen. well, Greg, I think has gotten a little bit of cabin fever. He didn't have that that gas <laughs> mustache too when I first met him online so he's uh he's getting after it up the there Fu Manchu, strong yeah i know it was the beard and i cut her down and uh you know it drives my kids crazy <laughs> but uh um right now i sort of like it to right? be honest i you dig know, it it's, yeah. it's a little tickle well you'll get guy all the guys are going to be like that's awesome right and all the women are like gross you know that's just how it goes but the one, it's the push and pull of the mustache. The one question we want to ask, uh, we ask all our guests, is what advice could you give your younger self? Uh, it could be business, could be life, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, well, yeah, great question, of course. Um, you travel back in time, you can see your younger self, and you can get them by the shirt and go, do this, don't do this. Or Listen... I have really enjoyed myself to the point where uh, at times today it'd be considered moderately inappropriate. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the, the other side of that is, is quit taking it so seriously. You Love know, it. Yeah. I would get wound up about an issue and I got to tell you, uh, it never changed the outcome. Yeah. 
So, so, you know, just take a deep breath and have a little giggle sometimes at yourself because sometimes it's funny. Yeah. I yeah. tell my kids, don't ever stop being silly. Yeah. The minute you take yourself too seriously, it's like, what are we doing here? You know, like, this is... <laughs> I caught myself doing it today. I was trying to work on the laptop, watching my three-year-old, two-year-old, and they were making fun of me because my, eye, my eyebrows were furrowed, <laughs> and I'm like really into whatever I was doing, and then I just had to stop, and we had to do a dance party. That's the right. rule, you yeah. know? There you go. That's so a good rule. Like that. Oh, I know. So next time when you drop something on the floor and it breaks, you know, your first response is, or, you know, it fell out of the fridge because someone didn't put it in there properly. It's, it's the old story. Who cares? Yeah. Right, right. Love Take it. two seconds and clean it up or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I uh, appreciate you coming on. Uh, Cortection.com, Core Shorts, uh, and then Injuries, Innovations, and Insight podcast. Wow, you got it. Is it out? Is it hey. out? not out yet? No. Okay, so very soon, but hype machine. Make that Google alert come up uh, if you want. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, man. Thanks, Greg. Dudes, thanks a million. See ya. Appreciate what about my sweat equity? Sweat equity. Sweat, 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 sweat equity. My sweat equity. My, my, my sweat equity. Sweat equity. What about my sweat equity?